<clears throat> as we come to look in the Word, uh, I ask you to excuse my voice a little bit. I'm, got a, I'm a little hoarse. Uh, <clears throat> was that, yeah, Mr. Ed? A little hoarse, yeah, all right. <clears throat> uh, anyway, as we come to look in God's Word, there is a principle of Bible study. You're all familiar with it. It is indispensable. It's total reliance on God's Holy Spirit. This precious book is given to us by God Himself, and only God can cause us to see the Lord and understand this book. Uh, let me share this verse before we pray together. <clears throat> it's Psalm 68, verse 4. Let me start this. Last time I forgot to do this. All right. <clears throat> Psalm 68, verse 4, it says, Lift up a song for him who rides through the deserts, whose name is the Lord, exult before him. And I just thought that was an interesting expression. Uh, Lift up a song for him who rides through the deserts. And sometime our lives get a little dry and uh, we begin to be oppressed and suffocate a little bit, but let's praise the Lord who rides through the deserts. So let's pray together and we'll look in the Word. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, so thankful we are this morning for the indwelling Holy Spirit. We thank you for every part of your Bible in a special way for the wonderful book of Judges. And we just pray that you would open our hearts to behold the Lord Jesus afresh as we meditate on this redemptive history. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to guide us because we claim it in the name of the one who deserves it. Amen. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> in our study, uh, we've come to the end of the Gideon story. Uh, God raised up Gideon, you know, to deliver his people from an enemy that was starving his people. And that principle goes any time any enemy keeps uh, God's people from being refreshed and fed. Uh, we have deliverance from that. And of course, when they were denied food, they were driven into the caves and they lived in darkness and in bondage. Uh, I've divided up the Gideon story in three ways. First, we looked at Gideon's preparation to be the Lord's instrument of deliverance. And we spent several weeks on that. And then the supernatural victory that God won through Gideon and the 300. And I believe Gideon and the 300 represent the remnant portion of the body of Christ. In other words, those who are looking to the Lord alone. Last week, I introduced the section that I call the mopping up operation. So let me tell you where that begins and where that ends. From Judges chapter 7, verse 22, when they blew 300 trumpets, the Lord set the sword of one against another, even throughout the whole army, and the army fled as far as, and I didn't name those names. But the point is, the army fled. Uh, in the initial victory, uh, thousands were destroyed and 15,000 remained and uh, out of 135,000. So these 15,000 now uh, begin to flee. And from the time they flee until the time they're captured, that's the mopping up operation that we're talking about. Judges 8.12 is the other end of it. When Zeba and Zalmunna fled, he pursued them and captured the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmunna, and routed the whole army. And especially verse 21, then Zeba and Zalmunna said, Rise up your, yourself and fall on us, for as the man, so is his strength. And so Gideon arose and killed Zeba and Zalmunna, took the crescent ornaments which were on their camels' necks. So that's the, the other side. That's the end 
of the mopping up operation. From Judges uh, chapter 7, 22 to Judges chapter 8, 21. Last week, I introduced this section. Uh, I'm not going to review the part where the many commentators that I had stood against <coughs> Gideon and his 300. Uh, some of them did not recognize Gideon and his 300 as the remnant. Uh, to many, it appeared to them that after the initial victory, in other words, when uh, the trumpet broke the vessel and the light shone through the broken vessel, from that point on, they say, it was all Gideon in the flesh. He no longer trusted the Lord from that initial victory all the way to the end. Of course, I don't accept that, and <clears throat> I hope you don't. If you do accept it, you'll be in good company. So you have to choose, good company or the truth. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> if you missed that discussion, uh, you, the CD is there. It's number 22. I do want to, however, review the last two principles that we looked at as we close. Number one, uh, Jesus is all I need. That's how we stated the principle. That's very easy to say, but that's actually difficult to believe and difficult to apply, that Jesus is all I need. The illustration is from chapter 8, verse 4. Gideon and the 300 men who were with him came to the Jordan, crossed over, weary, yet pursuing. And first they went to the people of Succoth, the people of God. Judges 8, 5, he said to the men of Succoth, please give loaves of bread to the people who are following me. They are weary. I'm pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. And then they went to the people of God in Penuel, chapter 8, verse 8. He went up from there to Penuel and spoke similarly to them. And the men of Penuel answered him, just as the men of Succoth had answered. In other words, they said, we're not going to help you. We're not going to feed you. We're not going to provide for you. Now, why did I say the principle is Jesus is all I need? And the answer is, because the remnant sought support from the people of God in Succoth, and they sought support from the people of God in Penuel, and they didn't receive it, and they won anyway. And what that means practically is, they didn't really need it. <laughs> they thought they needed it, but they didn't need it, because they didn't get it, and they still won the battle. Uh, even though they were weak and pursuing, the Lord gave them the victory. Now, we'll say more about Succoth and Penuel in another connection this morning. But for now, I just want you to realize we do not need them. Nobody needs Succoth. Nobody needs Penuel. Uh, our victory depends on the Lord and on the Lord alone. Jesus is everlastingly enough at all times, in all places, in all circumstances. I don't want to get too controversial here, but I have a great problem with uh, a lot of the Christian fundraising schemes that are around. Uh, that's given, in my understanding, it's given the testimony of Christ a black eye. And it's, it's just a shame. Under the cover of good stewardship, uh, it seems like everyone's trying to get their hand in your purse or in your wallet or in your bank account. They make it sound spiritual. They baptize it with spiritual words. And uh, because they baptize it and make it sound spiritual, uh, for example, there's a, a movement called seeding. It's seed faith. And the idea is, uh, this is God's principle of harvest. Uh, you give a seed, and you'll get a harvest. And so if you give $10, you'll get 100 
and so on. And uh, people are, God's people are so generous. They're eating into this if they're uninstructed. And God's people are being fleeced from God's people. And uh, other, now I'm sure there are hearts that are genuine. And God sees the heart. I don't want to condemn everybody. But a lot of this talk about faith promise plan and all that kind of thing, it sounds so spiritual. But the fact is, uh, it's just, in my view, many use it as they're just charlatans. They just want to get your money. Uh, <clears throat> I heard a, the claim that if you don't give to us, we're going to have to close down. you got to step up or we'll have to close down. Close down. <laughs> that, that's my opinion. If God doesn't provide, you ought to close down. I think that the Lord's in charge of everything, and he's the provider. Uh, <clears throat> he's all I need. He's all I need. Jesus is all I need. He's all I need, all I ever need. Jesus is all I need. May God help us uh, to enter into that great truth. Now, having said that, as I said, I want to just make room for those who are genuine. There are those who get involved in that, and their hearts are right, and God sees the heart. I can't see the heart. Uh, <clears throat> when we closed, I was, call attention, I was calling attention to another precious truth from chapter 8, verses 2 and 3. He said to them, what have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God has given the leaders of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb into your hands. What was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger toward him subsided when he said that. <clears throat> Even though it was the Lord in and through Gideon and the three hundred. Gideon was willing to relinquish all the glory. And especially when you see Ephraim, the people who are getting the glory, uh, he was even willing to let these unworthy people uh, receive the glory that really uh, they deserved and belonged to them. Uh, don't think that Gideon was giving Ephraim glory. If you notice verse 3, it says, God has given the leaders of Midian, Oreb and Zeb, into your hand. Gideon was giving God the glory, not Ephraim. Uh, Gideon had been warned, you know, early in the story that the glory belonged to God. That's why God greatly reduced their number. And that's why God pictured them as broken pottery and uh, a tumbling barley cake because God gets the glory. <clears throat> Let me give a couple of Bible illustrations of the same truth. Uh, it's like Amram and Jochebed. Anybody know who they are? Moses' parents. Moses' parents. Amram and Jochebed. Uh, Exodus 2-3. When she could hide him no longer, she got a wicker basket, covered it over with tar and pitch, and she put the child into it, and set it among the reeds by the bank of the Nile. Uh, that wicker basket, by the way, covered with tar and pitch, the, the same word is the word ark. That she patterned it after Noah's ark. And she made that the same way. <coughs> now, you might be surprised that they placed their baby in the Nile River. Since Exodus 1.22 says... Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who's born you are to cast into the Nile. Every daughter you are to keep alive. That river is the river of death, and it was running red with the blood of Hebrew babies. Now, isn't it amazing that uh, Amram and Jochebed would take their little baby and put them into the river where babies were being murdered. Uh, the, the point is that <coughs> when they placed that baby in the ark, they were not putting it in the river of death. They were putting that baby in the hands of the Lord. That's what they were doing. 
Another illustration of that same truth is Abraham. Remember when there was a division in his family about property rights. Genesis 13, 8. Abraham said to Lot, Please, let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen. For we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, I'll go to the right. If to the right, then I'll go to the left. Now, we know a lot about Lot. He was very worldly. He had a lot of problems. God tells him that he was righteous in Christ. So we know that. Uh, but let me ask this. Would you allow Lot to decide God's will for your life? Knowing what you know about Lot? You see, Abraham did not let Lot choose. When he gave the decision to Lot, he was letting God choose. He was putting it in the hands of the Lord. It didn't matter to him, left or right, north or south or east or west. He just said, I'm committing this to the Lord. Now, it looked like Moses' parents put him in the river of death, but they put him in the hands of God. It looked like Abraham was trusting Lot to make a decision. But he wasn't. He was trusting the Lord to make the decision. And just so, Gideon did not give glory to Ephraim. He gave glory to God. Uh, his actions proved that he wasn't seeking glory. You know, in fact, when God records this, I called attention to that last time. When God refers to this victory, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> He refers to it in Psalm 83. He also refers to it in Isaiah 10. And when he refers to the victory, he doesn't mention Gideon and his 300. He only mentions Ephraim, that baby tribe that wanted to steal all the glory. Psalm 83, 11. Make their nobles like Oreb and Zeb, and all their princes like Zeba and Zalmunna, who said, let us possess for ourselves the pastures of God. And God refers to victory over Midian. He gives Ephraim the credit. And then in Isaiah chapter 10, 26, the Lord of hosts will arouse a scourge against him. He's talking about Assyria. God's going to do to Assyria like the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. <coughs> and so once again, when God refers to the victory, it goes, the credit looks like it goes to Ephraim. Moses' parents put their baby in the hand of the Lord. Abraham put his decision in the hand of the Lord, and Gideon gave God the glory, 100% the glory. And so those two principles, the remnant always says, he is all I need. And the remnant always says, to God be the glory. That's where we left off last time. <clears throat> I want to say a word about Gideon's word to Ephraim. Uh, many people think when Gideon said, go ahead, you take the glory, you got more glory than I did. I only kill foot soldiers, you kill the leaders. Many people think that was a fulfillment of Proverbs 15.1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. I think it's that, but I think it's far more than that. Gideon was not trying to avoid an argument. Gideon was not trying to avoid a fight. Gideon was trying to give God glory. That's what Gideon was doing. You know, flattery. Some people accuse him of flattery there. He's just flattering Ephraim. Mm -hmm. Flattery is an insincere compliment. Gideon didn't give an insincere compliment. He told the truth. Gideon told the truth. God did give Oreb and Zeb into their hands. Chapter 8, verse 2. What have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? On the level of earth, you know, <clears throat> there's more glory 
taking down leaders than taking down foot soldiers. Uh, there were many, many victories over Al-Qaeda before bin Laden was killed. But once bin Laden was killed, all the cameras went to the Navy SEAL Robert J. O'Neill because he took down the leader. Uh, Gideon had his heart set on God receiving glory. <clears throat> and so much so, and this is a great test, uh, he didn't even mind if some unworthy person stole glory from him. Uh, he just let the Lord take over. Uh, that's a heart that's set on God's glory. Now, I want to continue with the mopping up operation. And so I'm going to give you four words that sort of cover the whole ground that we want to look at. And these four words, will uh, you'll see how it just sort of summarizes everything that's left. The first word is Sukkoth. <clears throat> Chapter 8, verse 5, He said to the men of Sukkoth, Please give me loaves of bread to the people who are following me. They are weary, and I'm pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. The second word is Penuel. <clears throat> this is, by the way, the very same Penuel where Jacob wrestled the angel of the Lord. It's exactly the same place. Judges 8.8, 8. he went from there to Penuel, spoke similarly to them. And the men of Penuel answered him, just as the men of Succoth had answered. <coughs> the third word is dynasty. Now a dynasty is a succession of kings from the same family. <clears throat> God's people not only offered to make Gideon king, but to make his family a dynasty. Listen to Judges 8, 22. Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son, also your son's sons, for you have delivered us from the hand of Midian. And then the last word is the word ephod. Judges 8.27, Gideon made it into an ephod, placed it in his city, Ophrah, and all Israel <clears throat> played the harlot with it there, so it became a snare to Gideon and his household. If we can look at the truth involved in Succoth, Penuel, Dynasty, and Ephod, we'll have covered the remaining ground that we want to look at. <clears throat> now we'll see how far we get. <laughs> Actually, the first two words, as you know, are closely connected. Succoth and Penuel. Uh, I described earlier the three groups, Ephraim, Succoth, and Penuel, uh, as the people of God. These are not Canaanites. These are God's people. The people of God who oppose the testimony of Christ and do not support the remnant. That's who's represented by Ephraim and by Succoth and Penuel. Last time we looked at Ephraim, so this time let's begin with Succoth. Let me give you a couple of general facts first, and then we'll move to the principle. <clears throat> the word Succoth means booths. B booths, B-O-O-T-H-S. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> a booth is more permanent than a tent. Uh, it was actually named by Jacob. Listen to Genesis 33, 17. Jacob journeyed to Succoth, built for himself a house, and made booths for his livestock. Therefore, the place is named Succoth. And so Jacob named it when he moved out of the tent into a house and when he made these booths for his animals. But by the time of Gideon's story, hundreds of years later, Succoth is evidently a very large town. I say that because of the size of the leadership at Succoth. Judges 8, 13. Gideon, the son of Joash, <coughs> returned from the battle by the ascent of Heres. 
And he captured a youth from Succoth, and he questioned him. And the youth wrote down for him the princes of Succoth and its elders, 77 men. This young man wrote down the names of 77 princes, or leaders, or sheiks of Succoth. <clears throat> uh, let me ask you this. If someone captured you and demanded that you write down 77 names of somebody in your government, uh, can you name 77 congressmen? Nope. I couldn't do it. I couldn't do it. If they asked me to write down 77 names of my family and friends, I think I'd struggle coming up with 77. I'm impressed with this young lad. I don't know what he was studying, but he sure knew the leaders of Sukkah. <clears throat> I'm also impressed that 5,000 years ago, they knew how to write because he wrote down these names. That's pretty amazing, too. <laughs> <clears throat> the part I want to focus on is that in speaking of Succoth, the Holy Spirit puts the spotlight on, calls attention to the leadership. That's important. The leadership of Succoth. In other words, you'll notice when Gideon came back and, and God dealt with Succoth, he didn't deal with everyone. He only dealt with the leaders. And that becomes important uh, as when we get to the principle. <clears throat> I want to give you my uninspired opinion of verse 7. Chapter 8, verse 7. Gideon said, All right, when the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmunna into my hands, I will thrash your body with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. That word thrash has caused some commentators a lot of problems. Because it means to thresh. To thrash is to thresh. Uh, Judges 8.17, he tore down the tower of Penuel and killed the men of the city. <clears throat> and some would say, since the men of the city in Penuel died, and because it was the same crime, they didn't offer bread to the believing <coughs> remnant, therefore... If they died at Penuel, they must have died at Succoth. And so many commentators interpret the thrash as threshing machines. In other words, iron machines. They mowed them down. Gideon came back, put them under the threshing machine. <clears throat> now, we know that happened in the Old Testament. Syria did that to the, the inhabitants of Gilead. We read about that in Amos chapter 1. Verse 3, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus and for four, I will not revoke punishment because they threshed Gilead with implements of sharp iron. Now, I don't see any evidence of that in Judges and in the story of Gideon. <clears throat> One commentator who had visited that area said, that in the area of Succoth, even today, there's a forest of thistles that grow as high as a horse's head. I don't know if that's true. That was his testimony. Judges 8-7. Gideon said, all right, when the Lord has given Zeba and Zalmunna into my hands, I'll thrash your bodies with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. And then in verse 16, this is also key. He took the elders of the city and the thorns of the wilderness and briars and disciplined the men of Succoth with them. The word discipline in the Hebrew is he taught them a lesson. <clears throat> well, you get whipped with thorns of the wilderness, you're going to learn a lesson, I think. But if you die, <clears throat> I don't think you learn the lesson. And so that's my uninspired opinion. I don't think they were actually killed I think the leadership was severely thrashed, literally, with the thorns. They were whipped. And I got an idea. It was public. And we're going to get to the principle. But I think God allowed their flesh to be ex experienced so that uh, it was exposed and people could see the flesh. All right, let me get a little closer to the principle. <clears throat> I pointed out several times, and I need to say it again, 
that in my understanding, Gideon and the 300 represent the remnant of God's people. In other words, those who are trusting the Lord. The Lord is living in them. The Lord is living through them. The Lord is the one doing the work. He's the light shining through the broken vessels. Seeing Christ in the remnant must be followed throughout the whole Gideon story. You can't stop dead in one place and then say from now on it's just Gideon on his own. It's the Lord in Gideon and in the 300. And unless we see that, we're going to get confused when we come to a passage like this. I don't think anyone would argue it was not Gideon and the 300 who won the victory in the valley of Jezreel. It was the Lord in Gideon and the 300 that won the victory in the valley of Jezreel. It was not Gideon and the 300 who were weary yet pursuing. It was the Lord in Gideon and in the 300 who was weary and yet pursuing. It was not Gideon and the 300 who captured Zeba and Zalmunna and defeated the last 15,000 men of the enemy army. It was the Lord in Gideon and in the 300. <clears throat> and since it was the Lord in Gideon and the 300 in the valley of Jezreel, pursuing the enemy, capturing Zeba and Zalmunna, uh, overpowering the last 15,000. Why do we think it was Gideon and the 300 who have now come back to take vengeance on those that didn't give them bread? It is not. It's still the Lord in Gideon and the 300. This is not personal vengeance. This is not Gideon repaying evil for evil. That's not what's happening here. This is the Lord in Gideon and the 300 dealing with the leadership of Succoth and those strongholds of Peniel. And we'll see that when we get to the principle. <clears throat> Before I state the principle, I want to give one more uh I want to give attention to one more expression, and this is sort of a key to understanding the principle, uh, the, the ways of God behind these stories. It's Judges 8, 6. The leaders of Succoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna already in your hands that we should give bread to your army? Now, when they said... Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna already in your hands? In other words, they were saying, you have had some victory, but you have not yet had a complete victory. You don't have all of the enemy in your hand. You're still in a war. You've tasted victory, but there's more ground to be possessed. Your victory is is incomplete. I think it's noteworthy that Gideon and the 300 were not distracted along the way. As the Lord lived in them and through them and they were going all the way to complete victory, they could have been distracted. I know I would have been. After that initial victory and everybody fled and then I saw all of the spoils all over the ground, do you think I still want to chase the enemy? When I see all that gold and silver and all that all over the ground, I might want to fill my saddlebags. I might want to do something. But they weren't distracted. And I know I would have been distracted when Ephraim came along and started crying and, and saying, you left us out and you didn't give us uh, opportunity and all that kind of stuff. I would have been distracted also with the leaders of Succoth and the leaders of Peniel when they refused to help the remnant and support them. But Gideon, when he heard, you don't have complete victory yet, he went right on and said, I'm going for complete victory. 
and Gideon and his 300, they weren't distracted by material wealth or by immature Christians <laughs> or those standing against the testimony of Christ or those who wouldn't support them. Uh, he just pressed on to complete victory. Now comes the principle. When you, as the remnant, when I, as the remnant, illustrated here, when we press on to complete victory, something wonderful happens. That's what we want to look at. Something wonderful happens. Uh, let me read it again. <clears throat> what happened to the leaders of Succoth, who had stood against the testimony of Christ. Verse 7. Gideon said, all right, when the Lord has given Zeba, Zalmunna, into my hands, I'll thrash your body with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. I have no doubt it was literal in Gideon's day, but that literal picture becomes a great principle now. Judges 8.16, he took the elders of the city, thorns of the wilderness and briars, and disciplined the men of Succoth with them. Uh, <clears throat> Again, I want to call attention. It's not Gideon and the 300 coming to thrash these leaders. It's Christ in them. The principle can be stated in these words. Someday, when I enjoy complete victory, and that's by faith, and it can be right now. When I enjoy complete victory, the victorious Christ in me will expose the flesh of all those leaders who have stood against the testimony of Christ and refused to support the believing remnant. He'll deal with their flesh. And I'm so glad I don't have to. And I'm so glad that you don't have to. By tearing their flesh with thorns, all who were in Succoth were able to see how fleshly their leaders were. Uh, they stood against the remnant, but now it's all revealed as flesh. Uh, it was clear to them at the end who was trusting the Lord and who was not trusting the Lord. Complete victory in my life will finally expose all those who stand against me. Complete victory in your life will expose those who stand against you. Many of my commentators suggested that it was Gideon and the 300 who were living in the flesh. No, it was Succoth, the leaders of Succoth, who were living in the flesh. And those in Penuel who were raising false towers. Let me take time to turn this over. <clears throat> Our full victory. In the end, uncovers, discovers, reveals how fleshly the leadership is. See, they were judging by sight. Uh, and you know, by sight, uh, this 300, Gideon and his 300, they actually did look like a band of losers. You know, uh, they're all ex uh, exhausted and they're chasing 15,000 men. Later, that was seen to be flesh. That was by flesh. Uh, they compromised. They were afraid of the enemy. They said, well, what, what if you don't win? What if they win? They're going to come back. They're going to have revenge on us. Uh, they had no love or compassion on God's needy people, especially when it would cost them something. That was a time of uh, scarcity of bread and so on. All of these things will be brought to light when we show up victorious. That's all we have to do. Keep trusting the Lord. Keep trusting the Lord. A similar principle was true at Peniel. Judges 8, 9. He spoke to the men of Peniel saying, When I return safely, I'll tear down this tower. Judges 8, 17. He tore down the tower of Peniel, killed the men of the city. Just as the leaders of Succoth were revealed in all of their fleshly wisdom and counsel, so the men of Peniel, for taking, for trusting in, they thought they were safe in that tower. They were trusting in a false refuge. <coughs> I think most Christians are familiar. I think there's actually a Christian song 
about this. I don't know it, but I think there is. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and are safe. There is there there is a chorus on that. I thought there was. Yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. Well, anyway, my point is, you know where the strong tower is. And I know where the strong tower is. The Lord is a strong tower. Amen. Psalm 144, 1 and 2. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war, my fingers for battle, my loving kindness, my fortress, my stronghold, my deliverer, my shield, and he in whom I take refuge, who subdues people under me. Part of the ministry of the remnant is not only pointing to the Lord, your strong tower, run to your tower. But there's another part of the ministry, and that is Proverbs 21, 22. A wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the stronghold in which they trust. It's also the ministry of Christ in us to bring down the false strongholds, strongholds in which they trust. <clears throat> Just as the leaders of Succoth were revealed that all their advice was fleshly, so the men of Peniel, their false tower, had to come down. Let me state both principles side by side. Someday when I enjoy complete victory, the victorious Christ in me will expose the fleshly teaching of all those who have stood against the testimony of Christ. <clears throat> One day when I enjoy complete victory, the victorious Christ in me will bring down all the strongholds which are not Christ. Now I could spend a lot of time trying to illustrate and apply the many fleshly teachings that the men of Succoth give rather than looking to the Lord, but I won't do that. I'll let the Lord apply that for you. Now, let me just say it this way. Any counsel that stands against the testimony of Christ is fleshly. Any counsel that stands against the testimony of Christ and the believing remnant is fleshly. Uh, <clears throat> and I'm so glad, I tell you before, I'll say it again, that I don't need to deal with those who are teaching false things. Uh, I just show up victorious, and they, they're exposed. I just show up victorious. I don't need to raise support from them. Uh, I don't have to try and convince somebody that they're reasoning wrong. My privilege is to show up in complete victory, and that puts the law of silence on their lips, and, and they have nothing to say that brings down their towers. <clears throat> Any tower or stronghold that is not the Lord, it's coming down. Anything the Lord has not planted is going to be rooted up. Now I'm going to skip over the spiritual warfare verse I had in 2 Corinthians 10 <clears throat> because I want to get to uh, the next part here. <clears throat> Judges 8, 18-21 this is a word about Gideon and his son Jether. I don't want to skip that. That's not one of the four words. But I don't want to skip that, but I don't want to deal with it this morning. So uh, it's my full intention to revisit Gideon and his son Jether. Remember, he told him to slay, and he was too young, and he was afraid. Uh, there's a wonderful principle there, and I want us to look at that. Uh, <clears throat> look at Judges 8.22, please, as we come to the end. The men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son, also your son's son, for you've delivered us from the hand of Midian. Uh, I think, undoubtedly, this was a genuine offer from a grateful people. I think they were glad to be delivered from the hand of Midian. <clears throat> but they offered Gideon not only that he would be king, but that his family would follow on and there would be a dynasty. 
Now, you remember the recurring emphases over and over again in the book of Judges. Judges 17, 6. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did what was right in his own eyes. 18, 1. In those days there was no king of Israel. 19, 1. Came about in those days when there was no king in Israel. 21, 25. Last verse in the book. In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Gideon had learned to live by faith. He struggled with sight early on. But then he had come to learn to live by faith. And he was trusting an invisible king. And when he said in verse 23, I will not rule over you, nor shall my son rule over you, the Lord shall rule over you. He turned their eyes away from a visible king to an invisible king. The Lord is your king. Judges 8, 28. Now on your paper it says 826. That's a mistake. I'm going to quote 828 for you. So Midian was subdued before the sons of Israel. They did not lift up their heads anymore. And the land was undisturbed for 40 years in the days of Gideon. In other words, look to the invisible king. And that worked for 40 years. For 40 years. God had given a warning about desiring a king which could be seen with the eyes of the flesh. You remember in the days of Samuel. That was exactly the argument Israel made. Chapter 8, 6, and 7. The thing was displeasing in the sight of Samuel when they said, Give us a king to judge us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in regard to all they say to you, for they have not rejected you, they have rejected me from being king over them. Isn't that a sad verse? And then chapter 8, 19, and 20. Nevertheless, the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, there shall be a king over us, so that we may be like all the nations, that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. They pressed and they pressed <clears throat> because it was too difficult to trust an invisible king. Verse, chapter 12, verse 12, 1 Samuel when you saw that Nahash, the king of the sons of Ammon, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us, although the Lord your God was your king. Gideon saw the human king would displease the Lord, and he refused. He said, I will not be king. My sons will not be king. My grandsons will not be king. You have a king. His name is Jehovah. You have an invisible king. Now, immediately following the refusal to become king, Gideon did something strange. Chapter 8, 24. <clears throat> Gideon said to them, I would request of you that each of you give me an earring from his spoil. For they had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And they said, we'll surely give them and they spread out a garment, every one of them threw in an earring from his spoil. The weight of the gold earrings that he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. Beside the crescent ornaments, the pendants, <clears throat> the purple robes on which were the kings of the Midian, beside the neckbands that were on the camel's neck, Gideon laid down a robe and took a huge, cheerful, free will, offering. In other words, they didn't begrudge it. It was a free will offer. They were thankful to be delivered. And all of a sudden Gideon says, I have this one request. Give me money. <laughs> Give me silver. Give me gold. And so that garment was spread out. Uh, 1,700 shekels is about 50 pounds of gold. That's in our we measure the value of gold in ounces. Uh, this is an amazing thing. More than close to $100,000 in offerings he received. A fortune was given. 
And then we read verse 27, Gideon made it into an ephod, placed it in his city, Oprah. All Israel played the harlot with it there so that it became a snare to Gideon and all his household. Gideon made it into an ephod. Now an ephod is the shoulder dress of the high priest. It was quite fancy. If you want to read about it, it's in Exodus chapter 28. <clears throat> there were 15 precious stones and all in gold braids and all of that. But one of the most important parts of the uh, ephod was what was called the Urim and the Thummim. You can read many books about it. Let me settle you right now. Uh, nobody knows how it worked. So don't waste your time like I've wasted mine. Uh, what you need to know is that Urim, the word, just the word, means light. It means flame. And the word Thuman means perfect. Perfect light. Perfect flame. And however it worked, it was used to find the will of God. It was used to find perfect light. That's what the Urim and Thummim was. And I think that's what Gideon had in mind when he made this ephod. He just said, you don't need a king. You've got an invisible king. And you need to keep before your eyes the ephod, the perfect light, that we need light from the Lord. How it worked, some say that certain stones lit up if it was God's will and all that, I don't know. But the point is that in, when you read, many people think that Gideon took from that pile of money, from that, and made an ephod. The Bible doesn't say he took from it. The Bible says he took it. All of it to make an ephod. Why is that important? <coughs> I think Gideon was trying to be very clever here. He said, I don't want to be king. <clears throat> you got an invisible king. And I think he's saying, I don't want to be priest. You also have an invisible priest. And so he took almost $100,000 and made an ephod that no human being could ever fit in. It was so huge. Nobody could fit in it. And the Bible says all he could do was hang it up for everybody to see. He never wore it. Many commentators say he used to bring it down when he was playing priest and, and try to be a priest. There's no record of that. This was a huge thing. And when they looked at it, they would say, we have an invisible king and we have an invisible priest, and no human being could fit into that ephod, and he kept it up there so that they would have a visual aid always that God is king and God is priest. The problem is, any time you give somebody something to look at, they're going to turn it around, and they began to worship that thing. Gideon learned at the beginning. He was moving by sight, and God took him to faith. And then he lived by faith. And now all of a sudden he says, I want them to live by faith, so I will give them something to see that will encourage them to look to, by faith. And it didn't work. It never works. And, uh, you know, the same thing happened uh, you remember with Hezekiah and the brass serpent, uh, Moses put up that serpent in the wilderness. That was such a blessing. People that were bitten with snakes even over and over again, they were saved. And, and so they didn't want to throw it away. What are you going to do with it after the crisis? So they decided to save it. It may be because they thought, what if we see some more snakes? We would set it up. I don't know. But, but they saved it. And they saved it 50 years, 100 years, 300 years, 500 years. This thing is now a relic. This thing is now an antique. Now it's more than just the serpent that Moses lifted up. And we read 
in 2 Kings 18, he removed, this is Hezekiah, he removed the high places, broke down the sacred pillars, cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. It's about 700 years old now. Until those days, the sons of Israel burned incense to it. And it was called Nehushtan. Nehushtan is the Hebrew word, which means only a piece of brass. Only a piece of brass. And he smashed that relic. He smashed that antique and smashed it to pieces. Now, I'm going to try to develop that a little more next time because we're not quite finished with the Gideon story. But Gideon had a remnant heart. He didn't seek glory. He didn't seek power. He didn't want to be king. He didn't want to be priest. He just wanted people to look to the Lord. And they actually did for 40 years until he died. <clears throat> but the natural heart is incurable when it comes to sight. Give me something to see and eventually I'll worship it. It's a sad, sad thing. That was Gideon's mistake thinking that somehow sight could minister to faith. We'll pick that up next time. Comments or questions? What was the uh, description that Ephon had in Exodus? Uh, Exodus 28. 28. Yeah. <clears throat> yes? Uh, so Gideon took none of the gold for himself or his family. Exactly correct. Exactly correct. I don't think he had a covetous bone in his body. If he did, he could have done it earlier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he would have. Yeah. Well, let's pray together. Father, thank you for your grace to help me through this study. And I just pray, Lord, that the truths that are here, that you would burn them indelibly into our hearts. Teach us the joy of pressing on to complete victory. And then we'll see all the strongholds come down and we'll see all that is flesh exposed. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.